Patina de Persicis, Persica duriora purgabis, frustatim concides, elixas in patina compones, olei modicum superstilabis et cum cuminatuo inferes. Hi, I'm Andrew, and welcome back to From Eggs to Apples. Now, the title of this series comes from Roman literature, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about the ancient Romans. Compared to all the other cultures that are covered in this series, the ancient Romans have the best attested food culture. There is a lot of information about ancient Roman dining, and including a lot of primary sources. We have a lot of Roman cookbooks, and the most important Roman cookbook is a text called Apicius, or uh, more properly, it's De Rerum Coquinaria, which means uh, things related to the kitchen. This is a book that's really designed for professional chefs working in wealthy households, people who already pretty much knew what they were doing. So like a lot of other ancient ancient cooking literature, there's not really a lot of highly detailed instructions. However, we can still learn a ton from this book about how the Romans were eating and what kinds of ingredients they were using. Now, it's from the Romans that we get the custom of starting a meal with an appetizer, then having a main course, and ending with something sweet for dessert. The Romans like to end their meals with fruit. So in this episode, I'm going to be making two desserts from the pages of Apicius, both of which are based on fruit. Hi, I'm Fiorella and I'm a registered dietitian and foodie and I'm fascinated by ancient food culture. Today we're going to be talking about the ancient Romans and much of their food history can be told through the conquests of other territories in importing foods and ingredients from there. Their diet was also very similar to what we know to be the Mediterranean diet today, using seasonal fruits and vegetables, lots of legumes, nuts, and fish. They ate three meals a day, with the heaviest meal being at dinner, and this slowly changed over time. They were very savvy food scientists in their preservation of food, whether it was vegetables and vinegar, or fruit and honey, or their expert cheese-making skills, and also in their fish sauce named garum. They borrowed much of their medical knowledge from the Greeks, including the prominent physician Galen. They also compiled 600 herbal remedies in a manuscript called Materia Medica. The most important achievements in health that the ancient Romans created were the aqueducts, the sewage systems, and the public baths, illustrating their importance of cleanliness and warding off diseases. Today, Andrew is going to make an ancient Roman dessert for us, and I'm gonna go set the table, and we will see you soon. For this recipe, we're going to be baking some peaches in a glass dish, a flat type of dish similar to the patina that Romans would have used for cooking. Um, I've already peeled these peaches and taken the pits out, which is part of the instructions of the Roman recipe. We're also going to be putting a sauce on top of them, made from a bunch of different Roman ingredients. We have honey, um, this is Roman fish sauce, which I'll be talking about more later, cumin, and this is grape juice, which I'm actually going to condense first into a condiment that the Romans would have used in their sauces, and fresh mint to give it some extra flavor. And I'm also going to be using port, since the Romans cooked with a lot of different types of wine. The first ancient Roman dessert that I'm going to make is a patina of peaches. Patina was a type of shallow, flat uh, cooking vessel that a lot of Roman dishes were cooked in, and dishes that were made in this type of vessel were given the same name as the vessel itself, similar to some of our modern dishes. So the very first step is just to take the peaches, and uh, I've already cut the skin off and cut the pits out of them, so the first thing I'm going to do is just slice them so I can arrange them in the pan. We know that the Romans used peaches and pears and apples, a lot of different fruits that are still very familiar to us today. And they even had many different cultivars of those, just like modern orchards. I'm just gonna cut each half into some slices so that we can arrange them in the pan. And this is going to be baked in the oven, and I'm also gonna make a sauce with cumin. Before I put any peaches in the bottom of this pan, which is going to serve as our patina, um, I'm going to put a little bit of olive oil so that they don't stick. Now, the recipe also says to pour some more oil on the top after they come out of the oven before you add the sauce. 
And this is one of the recipes from Apicius, the Roman cookbook, that is a little bit vague. Um, it doesn't tell us exactly what cumin sauce to use. There are several different cumin sauces in Apicius. So I'm just kind of creating a cumin sauce based on some of the other ones and based on a lot of Roman ingredients that would have been available. So I'm gonna start placing these. Just make a, place them all going in the same direction and fill up the bottom of the pan. A lot of the Roman desserts that I've made, which I, this will be one as well, have a pretty soft consistency, and it would be something that people would have to eat with a spoon. At Roman banquets, diners would actually be responsible for bringing their own spoon. So this is our peach patina. And the recipe instructs us to bake this in the oven without any other seasonings and then add the sauce at the end. So I've already preheated the oven to 200 degrees. Um, I don't want it to be too hot in case these will burn. We just want to caramelize some of the sugars in them a little bit. So I'm going to put this in the oven. Now, while the patina is in the oven, while the peaches are baking, we can work on the sauce. So an ingredient that's very common in Roman sauces uh, is something called defrutum. Defrutum basically is just condensed grape juice, grape juice that's been boiled down into a syrup. In Apicius, you'll see a lot of recipes that instruct um, the chef to use things like this, which they would have already had on hand, the same way that we might have industrially created things like ketchup or tomato paste sitting in our fridge. Uh, Roman chefs would have had things like defrutum or just ready for use in various different recipes. So for this one, we have to make some defrutum. So I have some uh, just plain purple grape juice and I'm going to be heating it and uh, just boiling off some of the water and condensing it a little bit into a syrup. The Romans would also, in some of their recipes, they also might condense a sauce um, by adding starch the way that just like modern chefs would um, although Romans wouldn't have had cornstarch, they actually um, derived starch powder from wheat. Once this uh, boils down a little bit and gets into a syrup, I'm going to add some other very Roman ingredients. So other things that I'm going to add, we have mint leaves. Mint was a very popular herb in ancient Rome, um, as well as many others. Now this is port. Um, which is often used today as a cooking wine. The Romans cooked with a lot of different types of wine, including both red wine and white wine. Um, they also often cooked with a very sweet wine that they called passum. And in modern Italy, this is still produced under the name passito, and it's a direct descendant of, of the Roman wine. That one is made from raisins. It's made from partly dried grapes, so it's really, really sweet. Um, but I'm gonna add, actually right now, I'm gonna add a little splash of the port to give it that wine flavor to our grape juice. And then of course, another very important ingredient that I have to mention is fish sauce. So the Romans loved fish sauce, which is called garum in Latin. They would let the fish sit in the sun with a lot of salt, and then they would distill it, and they would derive a lot of different products from this. There was um, different grades and levels of garum, depending on how it was produced and what type of fish. And what's really interesting about it is that this stuff, which is used in tons of ancient Roman recipes, and is very common for a being so salty and so savory, it's really very similar to Asian fish sauce, which is very common in the cuisines of Southeast Asia. If you're not familiar with fish sauce, if you've ever eaten Thai food or Vietnamese food, for instance, you probably have eaten fish sauce because it's just incorporated into these other recipes. And the Romans used it in a similar way. But both the Romans and Southeast Asians developed these sauces independently of each other. So you can see it's starting to boil off a little bit. I'm just gonna, um, I'm just going to move it around a little so that I, I don't want it to burn. I'll add, I'm going to add the fish sauce once it gets a little more condensed, and then I'll also add the mint. I'm also going to add a little bit of honey for sweetness, which is the main Roman source of sweetener besides fruit. That's why these two desserts that we're making today both include fruit and honey, since the Romans did not have um, refined sugar. Uh, refined sugar originally comes uh, from 
sugar cane, which is native to Asia. And uh, Alexander the Great brought back a uh, word of sugar cane. The, the Romans and Mediterraneans were kind of aware of it by the Roman period, but um, it wasn't widely used in cooking. It was actually, at one time, sugar cane was considered more of a, more of a medicine, more of a medicinal ingredient than something you would cook with. I'm just gonna keep uh, letting this boil off some of the water. De frutum is a syrup made from fresh grape juice. There are also other Roman condiments that would be made from, uh, for instance, the juice of unripe grapes, which is very, very sour. That was a common way that Romans would add acid to their food, um, since they didn't have citrus or tomato like we might use for acid today. Then, of course, I'm also going to be adding cumin, which is the major ingredient that Apicius wants us to add here. Um, we might think of cumin as being an unusual addition to a dessert, uh, and the Romans really loved cumin. It was one of their favorite spices, as along with coriander. A lot of spices that we would still associate with Mediterranean food today. Um, fennel was known in ancient Rome. Anise was known in ancient Rome. Um, even a lot of nuts like almond and pistachio. I'm gonna add at this point, I'm gonna add some of these mint leaves. Um, I'm gonna be removing these uh, at the end, but I just want it to get some of that mint flavor. I happen to choose two Roman desserts that use fruit, although there certainly are other types of Roman dessert. There's a lot of them with cheese as well. There's Roman versions of cheesecake and all kinds of things like that. It's starting to cook down a little bit, so I'm gonna add a splash of the fish sauce. And a little bit of honey. Generally speaking, since ancient people like the Romans were not really eating refined sugars, the only sugar in their diet came from fruit and honey, and honey was a bit of a luxury ingredient. It wasn't something you had large quantities of every day. So generally speaking, people like the ancient Romans had much better teeth than people today. If you look at ancient Roman dentition of uh, the remains of people's bodies, they actually had quite good teeth compared to, compared to us today they wouldn't have really needed modern dentistry. Another thing that I often think about when I'm trying to recreate Roman food or historical food in general is that the Romans would have had access to a lot of different growth stages of plants. If they're getting plants in season, that means that you can get like the fresh, newly picked leaves or something like that. And so there's all kinds of different flavors that they would have probably been aware of um, that we don't really think about anymore because you can just go to a grocery store and just get whatever you want, whenever you want. Definitely Roman cuisine would have been very seasonal. So now you see it's starting to make kind of a syrup on the bottom. That's what we want, where you uh, can see the line when you wipe it with a spoon. I'm gonna go ahead and taste it actually. Mmm. Oh, it's really good. I actually like the cumin flavor with the other. It, it has the sourness from the grapes and the sweetness, um, but I think the cumin actually goes well with it. So now it's really getting syrupy, so I think I'm gonna take it off the heat now and let it coagulate a little bit. So while we're waiting for the peaches to finish baking, um, I can start working on the other recipe. For our second ancient Roman dessert, we're going to be taking dates and stuffing them with a whole almond. These dates have already been pitted, which means that a lot of the work has been done for us. And then we're going to top them with honey as well as both salt and black pepper. This is another recipe that appears in Apicius, actually right before the peach recipe. Um, and Apicius kind of makes a big deal out of the fact that these are uh, sweet meats, like desserts, that can be prepared at home. Um, probably because for ancient Romans, this is not something that you would be making every day at home. It's something that you would often be getting from a bakery or like going out to purchase that was made by a specialized professional. Very similar to our modern um, pastry shops and, and bakeries. Um, and it's actually a very simple recipe in which you're just taking dates and stuffing a whole almond inside and then the dates are gonna get covered with honey and we're gonna add some salt and pepper on the top. 
Now, these are pitted dates, so the pits are already taken out, which makes it really easy to just take an almond and stick it inside. I have also seen a suggestion that possibly the fact that a whole almond is being stuck inside the date here is actually an example of one thing that the Romans loved at their dinner parties, which was surprise and entertainment. A lot of Roman dishes have this element of surprise where the diners are not really supposed to know what they're eating or they're supposed to be pleasantly amused or surprised by, by something that they're eating. Um, and this could be an example of that, that you bite into a date and at first you realize, oh, they forgot to take the pit out, oh no, and then, and then you realize it's an almond and it's actually edible. All right, so I'm gonna take the peaches out of the oven because they should be soft and baked by now. The recipe at this point says to actually add a little bit of olive oil on the top. So I'm gonna just drizzle a little bit. All right. And now I'm going to add our cumin sauce. And again, I'm just gonna drizzle it on. And there is a patina of peaches. There are some recipes for patinai, these type of dishes that are in a flat, um, of this flat, like low sort of vessel. Uh, a lot of them include eggs. A lot of them are actually more like a souffle or a frittata. But as I said, anything that is cooked in this dish is called a patina. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there should be eggs in this dish since they aren't mentioned. Um, I'm gonna set this aside to cool down a little bit because the glass is quite hot. And then we can go back to the dates. So I have put an almond inside each of these dates. And then at this point, Apiku says to use heat. So I'm gonna be putting them in the bottom of a pan and putting some honey over it and just kind of warming them up a little bit. And I'm also gonna add salt and black pepper. Black pepper comes from the same plant as white pepper and both black pepper and white pepper were known to the ancient Romans. This would be a spice that was imported from quite far away. These um, have their origins in Asia, so they would be traveling along long trade routes to get to the Romans, which means that for a recipe like this that uses black pepper, probably was not something that the average uh, household would have. Um, it's definitely something that's more costly or expensive that would be found in like a wealthy family's kitchen. So I'm just gonna place them in the bottom. I'm just gonna pour honey over these. I'm gonna let the honey bubble a little bit. Let it get warm. And I'm gonna sprinkle with salt and pepper. You see black pepper being used in quite a lot of Roman desserts. Just like cumin being something that we wouldn't necessarily associate with dessert, the Romans really liked black pepper desserts. They also use another type of pepper that's not from Asia called green of paradise. The Romans called it African pepper because it comes from Africa. Right. So I'm just gonna, as the honey is getting nice and bubbly, I'm just gonna turn these over very quickly to get them saturated in the honey, and then they'll be ready. And again, this would be something that an ancient Roman would probably be more likely to buy this from a bakery, to buy this from a professional. There were ancient Roman pastry chefs, basically, called dulciariae, that were responsible for making stuff like this. Let it cook for just another moment. So our two ancient Roman desserts are done, and now they're ready to serve. Hey Andrew, what do you think of this ancient Roman table? I love that we have so much red, which is a very ancient Roman color, and we have lots of Roman stuff on the table, including for a Roman dessert at the end of a banquet, uh, you yes. would definitely have a phallus, or a statue of the god Priapus to represent fertility, surrounded by fruit. That makes sense. And more importantly, what do you think of my hair? Oh, you look like an Amazon. You look ready to hunt in the, in the wilderness.
I love it. That's what I was going for. And what is interesting in my research on the ancient food in Rome was it is very similar to what we know as a Mediterranean diet mm -hmm. today. And the Mediterranean diet is gaining more and more momentum as one of the healthiest. So I think that what we're, we should take from this is that to move towards our past for whole foods rather than processed and packaged foods for our nutrition. Absolutely. I think the main things that set apart a Roman diet from a uh, modern Mediterranean diet is just that there's some ingredients missing. Like, you don't see any tomatoes or certain in other uh, ingredients that the Romans wouldn't have had access to. Like eggplant, to. right, as well? Yes, eggplant as well. So, what I've made are, since the Romans, one of the ingredients they didn't have was uh, sugar cane, so they didn't have refined sugar. Um, so I've made some Roman desserts that are based on fruit. Ooh, love it. Um, so this is a patina, meaning a uh, shallow baked dish of peaches with um, a sauce made from grape juice and cumin. Ooh. And also some Roman fish sauce in there. Wow, interesting. The yeah. garum? Yes, garum is, it was one of the ingredients I used. That's great. And these are dates uh, stuffed with an almond and they're covered with honey and salt and pepper because the Romans like to put pepper in their desserts. Wow, and they look very luxurious. Definitely this would be something that you would be buying at a, at a professional shop and not something necessarily people would make at home. And black pepper and honey particularly are expensive ingredients for the Romans. And incidentally, modern Italians also use fruit after dinner as dessert as well, so that's interesting that that carried through. Yes, and that actually brings us to the name of our series, which is From Eggs to Apples, because that is a reference to a Roman banquet, that they might start with something like eggs, but then they would end the meal with fruit. Andrew, speaking of banquets, can you debunk a myth for us? Yes, absolutely. So you may have heard of the story of the vomitorium, mm -hmm. um, the idea that the Romans would eat at and gorge themselves at a banquet, and then they would go off and throw up and come back and yes. eat more. Um, so the vomitorium story is an urban legend that doesn't go back further than the 19th century. And in reality, the vomitorium was a real part of Roman architecture, but it was actually just an exit passageway. It was a, if you had an amphitheater, something like the Colosseum, with crowds exiting the building, they would exit through the vomitorium because it comes from the same root as the word vomit. It means it's expelling outwards. Right. So the crowds are expelled out from the building. That makes sense. So no vomitorium. No. But they did enjoy <laughs> this beautiful food, and today we're mm -hmm. going to taste our desserts. Yes. Andrew, what would I be eating this with my hands or? Since these are pretty messy, I think you'd probably use a spoon. Um, and Roman diners would have provided their own utensil. They would have oh. showed up with a, with a spoon to oh, eat well. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, these are great. Thank and what you. a nifty little snack, too, to have. Yeah. They're relatively simple. Like, there's only a few ingredients in mm, there. So. Very nice. I really like the cumin in this. I, it's surprising because you don't really think of cumin with a dessert, but I think it works really well. Do you taste the fish sauce? Not so much. It's just a blended in to the flavors of the other stuff, so you don't really notice that it's there. It mostly tastes like the grape juice and the cumin. Oh, fantastic. I'm going to give that a little try as well. So beautiful. Great after dinner dessert for the modern times. Mmm, <laughs> you're right. Yes. Very nice. Yeah. I'm Fiorella. And I'm Andrew. And this is From Eggs to Apples. Ancient recipes in a modern kitchen. We'll see you next time.